Hey everyone, this is Zan, and welcome to our first Dominion 6 multiplayer series. We'll be playing as Early Age McCone in the game EA Old Dogs featuring a bunch of Dominion's 5 veterans. So hopefully we all have some sort of idea of what's going on as we bubble about with the new spells, systems, and nations. We will start with a quick pass through of the profit names and then move on to actual expansion. Hopefully we'll go pretty quick and contain expansion to just this first up episode and upload. As a warning, I'm not following any scripts, so do expect some rambling. We'll start with my own pretender, which is going to be Matt, Matt Nuke V2, because we are actually going to run a, an early version of Matt Nuke rather than the standard map generator. We have Sandals and No Socks, the Centurion from Ermor, played by Kosk, very good player. And so have I, the Scout, known as the Prophet of the Time Has Come. Copyright Infringement, the Froble Champion, Prophet of Borrow Not Stolen. I am Legion, the Warrior Chief, Prophet of We Are Legion. Commandments and Jor, the Ubaran Commander of 7,000 Commandments. Chairman Winnie, the noble commander of Tian Chi, prophet of Please Put the Bow Down. From Yomi, we have Zot, the Onishugo, prophet of Absolute Radiance. Someone just played Hollow Knight. And from Russ, we have Tutu Creature the Bear, prophet of Bear Mean Distribution Agency. I think that's all of them. Right, so we can go straight to our turn two. Tend to skip turn one, can't really do much. I am initially scouting about to see what I find. My first turn of recruitment was essentially some Giganti Hoplites in the E4, because if I forget to recruit this, then my population will be very unhappy in the fall, and I like getting it out of the way immediately, and then transitioning to Ultra Cyclops, because they have resource bonus, which will allow me to recruit more Hoplites, or Hoplites, however you prefer. I've chosen that over here in Supreme, is going to be the easiest province and just a basic formation where I have my lighter hoplites doing an attack rear and my more armored fellows just going to run straight in. They don't really need to wait for spells. We now go to the next turn, turn three, and immediately we'll get to see the battle at Spreen. We have our attack group squad moving along the side, although maybe a tad bit closer than I had hoped. Our larger hoplites are rushing forward with their much faster combat speed, which is fine actually because they are more armored and hardy than the human hoplites, so this might work out for me. Yep, it looks like with a little bit of an exception most of the lighter hoplites are running past to go fight the archers. It does look I'll, like I'll lose two of them, but I think they serve their purpose. The militia are now routing, and it's just the heavy infantry in the center. But the forces of Macone are pretty damn strong, if you haven't had a look at them. They do have a little bit more hit points. Nope, 30 hit points, but mainly that 20 strength, very high attack and defense, very high protection. All around, probably some of the better units you'll find in Dominions in general. Very expensive, very difficult to make, or mass, as they are recruitment limited, but I don't feel that'll be too big of a problem. Let's start speeding this up as this battle is going to its conclusion. Looking at the map, we now should be completing our last or our first Elder Cyclops, some more Hoplites, and rather than continuing into our Cap Circle, because I don't know how dangerous these ghouls will be, and I don't know if there might be some surprise elephants down in Ficinia, I'm just going to declare that uh, this army is going to go on an adventure, and we're going to go to the Raspberry Woods. Diplomatically, we have found Ermor in the south, which is not an awful matchup for me now. Maybe it will be more difficult later. But for now, I'm going to go into the Raspberry Woods just because I'm curious at what is in this farm, and I don't want to risk the ghouls and the elephants. 
Now on turn four, we'll witness what goes on in the Raspberry Woods. We have no reinforcements to our initial army, but we are going to keep the same formation. Thankfully, there's not much here. So our attack rear, same thing happens. Two of these guys kind of get caught out and isolated. But I don't know. I tend to think that works in my favor. Small sacrifice I am willing to make. But relatively an undefended province that does come with a nature site, which is awesome. At this point, I'm going to turn away from the farmland, and maybe I should have just gone for it and trusted my hoplites even more. But, you know, ca caution tends to win out when it comes to some of my planning, at, at least at the beginning of the game. I say that while I'm also moving into Forest of Springs with my Elder Cyclops instead of something more disposable. <laughs> I didn't want to send the E4 just because I'm always extra cautious and never really writing down exactly when the event that happens is, and I really never want to move him anyways. So we'll be moving to the Forest of Springs next turn because I've decided it looks simple enough, and the forces of Matt v Nuke V2, we're going to have these circle around the long way to eventually come back and deal with the ghouls and the soulless because, well, who better to deal with that than my own prophet? Force March does not seem to be lending itself to the Helot slaves as some crippled units die during the march, but that's okay because we have a battle in Obakte. And this is our just regular traditional battle. Maybe I should have learned my lesson and move these hoplites a little further down, but it kind of works out. Well, sort of, because we lose a Gigante, and that's never good. So, uh, that's unfortunate, but hey, eh, we took the province, and it's just our first army with only four. Here we'll see a little bit more hoplites and what they can do, especially when supported by an Elder Cyclops. Normally this might have been kind of spooky, as there is a lot more heavy infantry than there were in other provinces. But I think just having eight of these hoplites, this is actually kind of an even match. He, whoa. That guy took a big hit. That's unfortunate, but... I think they can still repel the other spearmen, and they should mostly be able to ignore the slingers. I say that as this man is really taking some hits in. Oh, but we got fire magic to the rescue from the Cyclops, who was trying to stun them earlier and figured, well, if I'm going to land a hit, better that he use a fireball instead of uh, some spicy wind, you know? Speaking of spicy wind, he's burning some bushes. Yeah, Cyclops are not the most precise of mages, but even with that imprecision I'm able to take the province with no losses. We have some events now in the Forest of Springs that I just took, where we find some water gems. And the first province that I had conquered, Spring, uh, we have some brigands in a ruin. Which is kind of unfortunate because unrest is going to reduce the amount of not only your income, but your resources that you get. So that's a toughie. But regardless, we're going to keep moving our Prophet squad more north. Uh, traditionally, in a map nuke layout, the players are placed very specifically, and usually you're going to move out uh, two across at most because you risk running into cap circles or a player's nine, which means provinces that may not necessarily be their cap circle, but are close enough that they may consider them, quote unquote, theirs. And although I'm a very strong early age nation, I'm, I would prefer to avoid some early conflict. So we're going to rejoin or combine our forces at Trollland, led by Aristeus and He's going to be a lot more durable and somehow more disposable commander than Pandokos, the Elder Cyclops. Of course, his script is just going to be fire darts, uh, just because I don't want him in melee just yet. And Scorpion Cracks, we've seen this army. I think we can skip them going forward. They're going to be doing the same thing over and over again. 
At home, we're going to recruit some more polymarks and some more hoplites. I would like Elder Cyclops for the resources, but I also don't want to lead armies with Elder Cyclops. And so polymarks up, it is. Moving on to turn six, we research some early constructions. Uh, in the Scorpion Cracks, I believe that's just our regular army, but in Troll Land, we're going to have our combined forces featuring the two mages. And let's see if casting fire darts early on does actually do anything for me. Okay, swing and a miss. Gust of Wind stuns five. Misses horribly, and Fire Darts comes in and does nothing as well. Yeah, neither of these two mages are really doing anything right now, which is kind of awful. I hope we win this battle before they come and kill my Cyclops, because he has no armor. You'd think he'd wear, like, knee plates or something. Okay, burning hands. Takes a lot of damage. Oh, he got interrupted actually, but cast it again. And is right routing with a battle fright, so that is very unfortunate. This is why you don't want to lead your parties with Elder Cyclops. You want to use them you want to use some polymarks, which are relatively immune to basic independence. Thankfully I don't lose anything somehow. But we have now the declaration of war on the Helot population, which is why I wanted to have that E4 as my first mage. Otherwise, that event can go poorly. And then we find a fairy court in Troll Land, meaning we get none of the money, all of the sloth, and some uh, luck and growth, which is pretty cool. Uh, we do find Roos, and Roos messaged me at this point asking <laughs> about had to play McGone because he, he saw my province, he immediately saw the sloth scales, and he was asking what sm sloth McCone looked like. Um, and me, uh, being sleep deprived or tired at the time, I kind of got into it. Th I didn't realize that that event had happened. And so I started uh, looking into what sites give you potential sloth scales. I figured it'd probably be like a glamour site or something that, that seems up its alley. So it ended up being pretty funny, <laughs> pretty funny conversation. And essentially, he just wanted to have access to this cave, uh, which is probably fine. I mean, Roos gets cave recruit mages that are good researchers. So I'm sure giving them an entire cave system on their own wouldn't bite me in the butt. But if anything, I can come to Strongdale to come uh, do something about that. And then over at Scorpion Cracks, we also have another cave system. And I did see that there were Zots in there. And so, you know, one of the things when you're playing McCone that you need to remember is your late game is going to need some help in the sorcery department. And so investing in Zots early is one way to potentially get into Death Magic. And Death Magic it lets you do things here and there, summon some good troops, summon some good mages. I don't know necessarily how well it has translated to Dominion 6. I haven't really used it yet in the late game. This is my first multiplayer game here. So regardless, I figured having Death Magic would be better than not having it. So I'm keeping these in mind, and I will come back for them eventually. On the other hand, we do meet Tianqi. And Tianqi could potentially be a good matchup for us, depending on what units they use which was already kind of answered that they're using these Warriors of the Five Elements with some Nobles. So the Nobles are going to perform awful against the Gigante Hoplites. And the Warriors of the Five Elements would perform awful against the Helot Peltists because of these little Javelin throws. And that's actually where the name of my Pretender, Exceptional Impressment, has come from. So the last game I played as McCone in Dominions Five, my main adversary was Ohm. And Ulm time, tends to forget to use shields and have lightly armored units. And so all I did was spam Peltists. So many Peltists. So many Peltists that even as the Ulmish men were cutting right through them, 
they were just getting fatigued and then getting killed by more feltists. And so exceptional impressment was born. <laughs> so depending on who I decide to fight, uh, that might play a part in it. Unfortunately, to my north, we have Ubar, and nobody wants to spawn in the early age next to Ubar. And so depending on what choices I make, I could be food for Ubar. That is, if I recruit the Peltus, they can walk into me. Or I could just go straight out and kill them, which I'm sure the lobby would appreciate using the Giganti Hoplites and their magic spears. I understand that they do not have spirit sight, but they do have very high attack skill regardless. And this weapon can repel the Jin in general, who don't have long weapons. So it's a good start. It's a good start. I think that's going to wrap up turn six. I'm going to keep doing these kind of semicircles around my capital with my forces at Troll Land moving down to Walden and Scorpion Tracks to the Glistening Dew Forest just because I don't I don't get strong vibes that Slingers are going to do much to any of my heavy infantry. And having the option, for the same reason as the Zots, having the option to recruit Nature Mages, like the ones I would get from this Jaguar Tribe province, is definitely going to be a key to ensuring that I have some late game potential as this nation. Because in Raspberry Woods, there's no Shaman or otherwise there. Let's move on to the next turn. Now on turn seven, we do get a treat. We get to see what Ermor is up to and what Bless they're taking and expanding with. So we see that they have double Centurions, just in case there's an attack rear. And their Prophet in the back is going to cast Blessing. Let's see how these Equites are. So his Bless is Attack Skill, Spirit Sight, and a little, little bit of Strength, a little bit of Hit Point. So this is a typical anti jinn build, just ensuring that he is able to actually kill them. So the Sacred Child Equites were pretty good in Dominions 5, but I'm concerned about them in 6 due to the low magic resistance on the War Horse and relatively low armor on it too. Calvary has had a tough time in 6 when it comes to low armored horses. The Rider itself has fairly good defense attack skills, very good stats actually. Recuperation skilled Rider. They're not bad, so I, I would be curious how, as the game progresses how well they do. They still have Light Lance? Yeah, and they have a, a Broadsword, which is one of the better weapons for your units to get. Their Lance Charge is okay, I guess. But he's got some attack rear going on. Let these lines crash. Okay, so it looks like this attack rear might just take everything out for him, but... Oh, it looks like that Lance Charge has routed the Light Infantry at the cost of one of his Equites. The rest of them are working on the Archers, and they look to have routed them, which is good. And so for the cost of at least one Sacred so far, I think this looks good. And now we know they're plus, which is pretty cool, because now in Dominion 6... Oh, they lost two. Now in Dominion 6, I'm able to see their Bless at any time. I don't have to actually pull up my notepad and write this down. So definitely a good improvement. Uh, I'll show you that after these battles. So Glistening Dew Forest. Again, this is our just starting expeditionary army, so we can probably skip through this. And then in Walden, it should just be a bunch. Yeah. Just a bunch of these hoplites. Oh, but there's heavy cavalry involved. That's never good. I started casting some Temper Armors because it's pretty good. I don't know who I hit it, who I hit with it, so we'll keep an eye out if he casts that again. There he is. Uh, there you go. So Temper Armors looks to bump them up just a little bit. They already have three Natural Protection, but and very good equipment, mind you. But yeah, this 27 Head Protection, 22 Body Protection. That is pretty darn good for 30 hit points. This long magical spear, formation fighter. Great unit overall. These uh, lance-wielding heavy cavalry, which would normally give 
a lot of other sacreds a run for their money don't really stand a chance especially not as i continue casting temper armors this is one of the reasons i went up construction earlier just to have something productive that my polymarks could cast without risking them in melee good flame bolt right there too a little bit more accurate than the cyclops but i'm concerned that by saying that he might uh, shoot a hoplite or something right after. Regardless, as the heavy cavalry route, I don't think this light cav is really going to be a threat. So we can move on. We have our event in Macon where the Krypton is on its way. The Helots are being massacred, restoring order, which is pretty cool. This happens in every city every fall. And in Obakte, we get a lab, an Azure Mage, and two Azure Initiates, which is a pretty good way to, I guess, jumpstart our research. It's also a good way to site search with MBIF over here, because uh, I do like searching uh, whatever path it is to at least level two in every province eventually. So that's pretty neat. Uh, the other two guys, I mean, they can just mostly research. Yeah. <laughs> And what I was going to mention earlier when I was talking about Ermor, so for those of you that don't know, if you go to the Pretenders of the World, it'll now actually have a column for your Gnome Blesses. And here we have Birkenstock Limited, and we know his Bless is Attack Skill, Hit Points, Strength, and Spirit Sight. And if this releases before I do a Pretender Overview or whatnot, which might be possible, then let me just show you my bless. I know I haven't mentioned it at all just because McCone doesn't care about their bless, but I found one that looks fun. And so my bless is an aging. And there's a second part to it. And I was really concerned about that second part because, well, even if your bless was incarnate, it's supposed to show up here. And for whatever reason, it didn't. So I was pretty spooked about it. I won't mention it in case I don't do a Pretender Design upload beforehand. And that way I can leave it as a surprise. Because it, I feel like it might have been surprising for <laughs> whoever I'm going to be fighting at the time. So the Azures are heading back to Macon. I'm going to try and move to Lombaria. Uh, I have some concerns on why I'm going here. A little bit of greed because I see a river and a farmland and those tend to be fantastically large provinces. And over in Walden, we're going to move down to Faster with just the Hoplite squad. And then we have another Hoplite squad moving down to Pistinia. The only unfortunate thing about it is it's very likely that these Equites will move to Strongdale and then Chasm home or Chasm home. So I might have to reroute the army that does take Pistinia, which is unfortunate. Uh, it's possible that I should have just sent that army up to Dathan or elsewhere, as it does look like I am getting boxed in as my neighbors expand toward me. And sometimes that happens, and it's very unfortunate when all of your neighbors choose your direction to go to. Oh well, we'll see what happens then on turn 8. So, turn 8, we have three battles, and we purchase Aberaj's archers, which are just a bunch of Atavi. We finish the Krypton in Macon, and we get a Cryptes, which is a giant assassin, and that opens up a whole lot of opportunities for this nation. We'll talk about those as they come. Now, in Faster, our big hoplite phalanx is going to walk past these humans as they have been in Lombaria. This is going to be our starter army, so not as many hoplites as usual. Unfortunately, a lot more heavy cavalry than before. And here we have a Locos instead of a Polymark, so we cannot temper the armors of my hoplites. That can be tough. We do take out some of the cataphracts on the initial charge. But a bleeding wound is on this hoplite, and that does not bode well. A third of our hoplites will then die very quickly then uh, by that. 
And we're going to be left with these two badasses with a lot of experienced stars. And I guess we'll have to see if they're able to handle all of this cavalry on their own while the rest of the human hoplites just do their best not to die. Our flanking force over the battles has greatly diminished, but they're doing their job of distracting a lot of the enemy. And so this all comes down to, can these two hoplites kill this heavy cav before the humans die? Prophet is doing his best with Word of Bewilderment, but it's not a very strong smite. Confusion is an okay mechanic, I guess. Now the consequences of our actions are coming with the rest of the army joining in. The human phalanx has fallen, and it is down to these two gigantes, who may or may not survive. Thankfully, we've routed the, the heavy cavalry, which is good. So this isn't impossible. Well, I was going to say it wasn't impossible until, you know, they just kind of died. Well, we can only hope our prophet gets off the field. Come on. Alrighties. That's Holy Avenger triggering at that point. A, a final uh, flick off to the enemy. So I believe that was Lombaria? Lombaria. Yeah. It's really unfortunate that first top light took the bleeding effect on the lance charge. If that didn't happen, might, this might have gone differently. Maybe. Maybe I was biting off more than I could chew. And then the other province, again, our hoplite phalanx alone is pretty good. We actually had uh, one of our hoplites promoted. <laughs> the the one survivor, <laughs> the one human survivor, is no longer a slave. He's been promoted to a Neo mode, which I guess he wants to do, and he's a few hundred years too early to be promoted to even worse slaver than he initially was, <laughs> as happens in the late age. Well... At that point, then, I'm going to mix my troops to Dathan, including Apparagus Archers, just because the undead don't tend to have kind of shields, or at least the ghouls don't, or the zombies don't. If they were skeletons, that'd be a different story. As expected, the Equites of Ermor take Strongdale, and so I'm forced to go elsewhere. And where is elsewhere? Well, I can technically get to Elder Hill, and hopefully I get there before Rus and Ubar do. And same thing for the Broken Land. I don't think there are any other neighbors on the horizon. Here in our capital, we're going to start adding a few Peltists to my army just to buffer my troops a little bit and give my commanders some defense. And for those who haven't seen them, these are the Cryptes Assassins. They don't look as impressive now, but once you do give them equipment, they can be kept pretty strong. We're going to continue recruiting some Cyclopes early because ideally you want at least a Fire 3 Cyclops, just one of them, to craft you some items later. It would help to get an Air 2 Cyclopes, and same thing for a Water Cyclops. It doesn't necessarily be need to be Water 2, but at least Water 1 is good. So I'm getting a good mix of them. And you generally want to recruit them. I, I think you want to recruit them either if you want a Super Combatant that can magic phase, you want the air version, but I think it's more for magical item diversity in terms of what they can craft because they have this Master Smith bonus. But also to keep in mind the resource bonus that they give the province that they're in, and you want to make sure you cap out your hoplite production. In your capital, you can get seven of these a turn, seven of these a turn, and seven of these a turn, which is kind of crazy, honestly if you have the resources to do so. Now, whether that's worth it to you, I'm not sure. Uh, I personally don't use the Ectromos as much as I should. They have very high map move, and you can do fancy things with that. They can also attack rear a little bit better than the slower gilded ones, but for the most part, I do prefer just making gilded hoplites out of every fort that I can, and if I have money left over, then that means I'm not making as many hoplites as I could because I should make forts <laughs> to make more hoplites. Uh, 
maybe not the right way to play. Maybe I should be leveraging the Peltosts and maybe even the human Hoplites. But honestly, I don't want this to be a repeat situation where these Hoplites promote themselves. I, I'd rather all of my little humans be slaves and cost half, up, half upkeep. My pretender's name is Exceptional Impressment, after all. Anyways, we'll wrap up here. I think we just passed the 30 minute mark. And we are actually almost done with expansion. We've got an eight turns down in the first 30 minutes. And that's pretty cool. We're mostly boxed in. So we're going to have to figure something out very soon on where we're going to go. Because even though there are still some indie provinces around, I see here in Newland, TNC must have failed. I see here in Elder Hill that I might take that. I see here in Broken Land. But up here in Larian Swamps, I see a Cockatrice and Bloodhenge Druids. And let me tell you, I don't want to fight that. I do not want to fight that. So we'll see what happens next time with Early Age McGone on turn 9, I believe. Yeah, turn 9.